All right, here we are. And let me briefly remind you what we said uh, during the last, uh, our last hour meeting last week. We uh, started with the phenomenological discussion of the viscosity phenomenon. And I have shown you this diagram, which shows that uh, in the real liquids, if there is an internal dissipation channel for the energy open, which is due to the fact that when we shear one layer of a liquid with respect to another, then there is a friction force between those two layers. And then this drawing means that if I pull the upper layer with the force F, then the force which is exerted on the lower layers of the liquid is proportional to the change of the velocity with the depth of the liquid, which on that drawing is denoted by the uh, uh, axis Y. And it's proportion to the area uh, of the surface. And there is a coefficient there, which is the coefficient called shear viscosity. And um, the, uh, this coefficient has a dimension and the dimension is uh, the unit of the viscosity coefficient is called the Poise. And uh, this, if you convert the Poise into more common units like a Pascal, the unit of a pressure and time, then the one Poise is a 0 0.3 of a Pascal's time a second. The fact that the viscosity is uh, dimensionally related to the pressure will help us to solve several uh, problems in uh, what follows. I have also shown you a table of a viscosity for various uh, materials, starting from the, uh, uh, from the uh, castor oil and the last common, this glass column was a, uh, was a blood. And the reason why I uh, included this uh, extremely common language liquid, which makes us operational, so to say, uh, is that the blood is a, a, a very complicated liquid. And it is the only one which is mentioned here, which is not truly speaking a viscose liquid. It is because the viscosity of the blood depends on how fast the liquid is moving. And in addition, how much of it, it is in a given vessel through which it flows, like our arteries or veins. The liquids where the viscosity depends on the state of motion, so to say, are called non-Newtonian fluids, and they play a tremendously important uh, role, not only in, in biology, I just said that the blood is non-Newtonian fluid, but also in engineering. And uh, 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 you might find easily in the, uh, in the internet, lots of movies showing the very interesting experiments done with the very simple non-Newtonian fluid, which is a mixture of a starch with water. And uh, uh, that is the uh, non-Newtonian fluid, which you can cook up in your kitchen. Uh, uh, and if you will uh, use the, uh, the fact that the shopping galleries will be open, uh, next, uh, this Saturday, I believe, then uh, you can go to the toy store and in a better toy store, you might uh, occasionally find a toy, which is called the silly putty. That is a, a, a kind of a little box which you buy, which inside has, a, 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 is uniformly filled with the something which looks like a, like, a clay, but you can make a, out of that clay a, a ball. And when you hit with this ball a floor, 
you find out that this ball is bumping back like a, like a real rubber ball. And by when you leave that ball on the floor uh, or on the table for a while, the while means overnight, then in the morning you will find out that there is no ball anymore, but there is a flat layer of that clay, so to say, silly put it on your on your on the on the surface of which it's sitting. This is uh, uh, I I I had lots of those silly putties uh, at home for our grandchildren, but unfortunately. I was unable to find, I, I did some search this morning, but uh, I was unable to locate uh, what has left of it. Uh, the kids are now slightly too big to play with it. So this is a table of a viscosity, and that is uh, 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 a drawing which uh, is again a phenomenological experiment uh, which shows what are the differences between the ideal fluids, which we are studying until now, and the viscous fluids. This is a flow over the pipe, which has a different cross-section. And as you remember, the flow of the ideal fluid in such a pipe is governed by the Bernoulli law. And that means that if the uh, cross-section of a pipe is smaller than the uh, velocity of a liquid increases and uh, uh, the pressure which is measured by the manometers connected to these vertical uh, pipes uh, is then lower by a Bernoulli law. But if we will repeat the same experiment with the viscous fluid, then the experimental results is what is shown on this drawing namely the velocity in the narrower channel, uh, the narrower part of the uh, construction is now uh, smaller than in that was before. And there, there is a pressure drop uh, along the, the flow of the liquid. So these are experimental facts on, on, the, on those experimental facts we will try to build up a mathematical theory. We will essentially follow the analysis of our predecessors from the 19th century. And nowadays we can use this machinery of statistical mechanics, which I have introduced at the beginning of our meetings and derive the equations, assuming that there is internal friction. And uh, uh, that is, doable thing. And uh, the kinetic theory not only allows us then to derive the equations of motion for a real fluid, but also to calculate those, this coefficient, which we called a shear viscosity coefficient. Remarkable thing is that the expression for the value of that coefficient depends on dimensionality of the system. So in three dimension, real liquid, it is a finite number, but the calculation shows that in two dimension systems, if we will have a very thin, essentially monolayer of atomically monolayer of the liquid, then the viscosity coefficient for it will be non-existing that will diverge. So that means that there is no hydrodynamics in two dimension fluids. That is a tremendously important fact we, which we learn in the second half of the 20th century that the properties of the uh, many interacting particles depend on the dimensionality on, in which they are living. So we will uh, continue for a while by uh, discussing what happens with the viscosity by doing a purely phenomenological analysis. And later on, we will show that the mathematics and the theory explains uh, and allow us to 
fine tune this phenomenological considerations. So let's start with discussing uh, what we are doing all the time. This is a flow of a liquid, now a real viscous liquid through the pipe. And I'm assuming that this pipe is uniform all over. It has a certain length L and it has a certain area, cross section area, which uh, is denoted by the capital A. And as the experiment tell us, in order to push the viscous fluid through such a type pipe, we had to have a difference of a pressure on both sides. And on the side through which the liquid goes into the pipe, the pressure must be higher than on the end through which the uh, liquid goes out, out of the pipe. So the first question we ask is, what is the average velocity with which the flow, the liquid flows through that pipe? And I will denote this uh, kind of a mean velocity by a V with a bar on top of it. And the uh, experiments tell us that the pressure difference between the intake and outtake of the pipe, the difference of the pressure at both ends of the pipe is proportional to the mean velocity times the length of the pipe. This experimental fact me implies that the mean velocity is of course proportional to the ratio of the pressure difference and the pressure difference I shall denote as a delta, capital delta P divided by L. But the question is, what is that dependent? What are the other ingredients of that liquid which contribute to the relation between the average velocity flow and the pressure difference? The L is the length of the pipe, which is the, what is fixed by, our experiment. And uh, let's think for a while on what else can this average velocity depend. It can obviously depend on the viscosity coefficient and obviously on the radius of the pipe. So we can made an, an educated guess that the average velocity is proportional, of course, to the gradient of a pressure that is a ratio of a delta P over the length of the pipe to a radius of a pipe with the unknown coefficient exponent A and to the viscosity, which also might be to take into some power and there will be an addition number B, which tells us with which power the eta enter. If we make this assumption as it is here, this is a part of a very powerful tool used to analyze the hydrodynamic property, properties of fluids before the invention of a develop, developed mathematics and also before the computers allow us to solve a very complicated problem of hydrodynamics. And we will now do the dimension analysis as in the 19th century to get a result of, for the exponents A and B. And how we can do this? We can deduct the values of those coefficients either by and that we will do after the phenomenological part of our lecture by solving differential equations. But we can also essentially solve the problem without the dimensionless coefficient beta in the front of that, which in some sense measure a strength of this thing. All the other terms in this expression are having a dimension. So 
let's try to do this. That is our expression. And now let's do step-by-step -step analysis, what is on the left side of the equation and what is on the right side of the equation. On the left side of the equation, we have a velocity. And the velocity has a unit of a length divided by a unit of time. So I will denote the dimensionality of a physical variable by a square bracket. So the dimensionality of a velocity is a length, capital L, divided by some unit of time, which I called capital T. The units velocity are meter per second, so that is exactly what is on the left side of our equation. And now we have to do the analysis of the right side. A beta is a dimensionless number. So there's nothing we can say about it. Now, the pressure difference. The pressure is measured in units of force by the area. But the, if I multiply the force by the length and the area by the length, then the units of pressure is a force time distance, that is the energy or a work if you want, divided by the volume. So the unit of a delta P is energy per unit of the volume and the energy is the mass of unit of mass, capital M, a length and divided by the length square divided by the time square. And all of that is divided by the volume, which is the L to the power three. So all together, it turns out that the unit of a pressure the dimension of a pressure delta P is a mass times the inverse of the length times the inverse of a time with the power minus, with the power two. And we have a dimensional, the, the dimension of the viscosity coefficient. And this is a mass times L to the minus first and the time to the minus first. So we plug now that expression, this dimensionality into our expression for the mean velocity. And we got a complicated expression for those units L, M, T and so forth. So on the left side, we have the simple expression. On the right half, we have a complicated expression and some of the variables some of the units like length and time and, and mass enter with the different coefficients. There is a coefficient A and B, which we don't know what it is. So first let's concentrate on the time unit, dimension of time. Here we have a time to the minus second, and here we have a time to the minus one taken to the power B. So this combination of those powers of time from that term and the last term must give us the time to the units of time to the power minus one. So that can only be achieved if the coefficient B is equal to minus one. Well, if this is a minus one, then t to the minus one to the minus one is t to the power one, and t to the power minus two times t to the power one is t to the power minus one, bingo. We have gotten rid of the coefficient b by just looking at what happens to the unit of time in that expression. So we know that b is equal to minus one, and therefore, in our expression for mean velocity, the coefficient B is minus one. So mean velocity 
is inversely proportional to the viscosity coefficient. All right, that is a remarkable result. Okay, so now let's look at what happens to the coefficient A. Well, we now gotten rid of T and we just look at the powers of mass, the mass must cancel, all right? If mass must cancel, m is to the minus one, so mass goes away by the choice of a coefficient b to be equal minus one. Let's look now count the powers of L. This is the minus one, this is L to the power a, and this is L to the power one. So that L and that L cancels, and there is an L in denominator, so because all, all together must be proportional to the L, then A is equal to two. So we got the result that A is equal to two. If L is equal to two, A is equal to two, then this expression tell us that the mean velocity is a certain coefficient proportion to the the gradient of pressure over the length of the pipe, proportion to the R square and inversely proportional to the, to the viscosity coefficient. So we have a certain expression with unknown coefficient beta, but basically this problem was solved. We have solved a complicated, as you will see in a moment, ex differential equation by not doing any other calculations than counting the powers of the dimensional variables. And the only reason why I introduced that simple analysis here is that you should remember that each time you have a complicated problem to solve. It helps very often to get a feeling what should be the form of a solution and what we should look in by doing more or less the same kind of analysis, of course, not the same, not so simple, uh, which is the counting of the dimensions. All the physical expression must have a correct dimensionality. The mathematics in the physical problems, particularly in hydrodynamics, are dealing with the quantities which have dimensions, and that is of the great importance. By having this mean velocity, I can calculate the flow of the liquid through the pipe, namely how much of the liquid goes over the type, over the type. This is the area of a type of a pipe times a mean velocity. And if I calculate it, then of course the area is, uh, is proportional to the radius square. There is also the coefficient pi and so, but I can combine these coefficients into the coefficient beta and all of a sudden the flow becomes proportional to the fourth power of the radius. And that expression is what usually is called a Poise re relation. And the only problem is what is the coefficient beta? And as we shall see, the beta is equal one eight. And that is what we cannot guess or derive, if you want, by using a dimensionality analysis. Why this expression is important? It is important because it tells us how much of the liquid goes over the pipe with the given cylindrical pipe with the given properties. And uh, most of the blood vessels in our body is basically like that. So the flow of the blood and all what goes with the blood, all the nutrition in our body and 
predominantly the uh, oxygen is uh, carried by a flow of a liquid of a blood. So the distribution of the volume of a blood all over the network of a blood vessels in the animal body is incredibly important quantity. And that distribution is related to the mass of the, of the animal. And it turns out that by using the analysis of the, it was that basically that result, plus the fact that the blood vessels in animal body form a network which is governed by a laws of self-similarity, the laws of uh, which we discover, for example, by studying the fractal geometry is sufficient to derive one of the most fundamental laws of evolution. And uh, that law is called the allometry law, and which tells us that many properties of the animal body structure are universal in the same that they are proportional to the mass of the animal to the universal power, and that universal power is three-fourth. That was experimentally established years ago that it was three-fourth, but they proved that this is related to the basically to the two facts, a structure of the, of the network of the blood vessels and to the Poiseuille flow is a fairly recent phenomenon already of the 21st century. So we had, I have shown you that using a dimensionality analysis, you can basically solve the Poise flow in through the pipe. So that is, uh, let's, uh, I have a simple example, which refers to the, uh, uh, the numbers, namely uh, the typical uh, cross section of the artery uh, in our body is about the 10 to the minus third meter. And the, uh, the volume per second is about the one centimeter cube. So then the average velocity in our blood vessels is about the 10 to the minus second meters per second. And the maximum velocity, which is in the middle of the pipe is uh, twice as large. And since the viscosity of a blood at the average velocity is of the order of a 10 to the minus straighter pascals times second, then the pressure difference in the average cell, uh, blood vessel artery is about the two pascals. So I can also calculate a very important number in biology that is a power which is needed to push the liquid uh, a blood through our vessels. And that is very simple calculation on the bottom line of that slide. And this shows that the power needed to push the blood through the average artery is of the order of a 10 to the minus second of a what you might remember that what is the unit of the power. All right, so uh, let's go on now and do some mathematics. I apologize for this that this somehow it didn't show up properly. Uh, we remember that the equations of motion for a liquid, there are four equations. The one is the continuity equation, which tells us that the time derivative of a density is equal to the minus divergence of a particle current. And the other is that the time derivative of that current is uh, expression, uh, is, this is an Euler equation, and that the stress tensor P, capital P, is uh, 
just a density times a product of velocities plus a pressure. And this is a unit tensor. So that is the set of equations which govern the motion of the adiabatic flow of the liquid. And we are not talking about the heat diffusion in that liquid, but we assume that the liquid as a whole is uh, covered by, by the adiabatic walls. So the entropy is constant of the whole system. So that is the expression for the pressure for the stress tensor pi. And what is happening when we have a liquid, which is viscous? When the liquid is viscous, we will assume that the viscosity is just due to this internal friction we discuss in the phenomenological part. So that can be incorporated into the, our expression, our formula, our Euler equations by changing the definition of a stress tensor. We take the stress tensor as being simply the stress tensor for ideal fluid. And we, and the minus is completely historical. I mean, I could have written here a plus, it's rather, but that is what is conventionally used in hydrodynamics by adding to it a little addition term, which is called the viscous stress tensor. Then the uh, total stress tensor capital pi will have a form of the product of a density and two velocities. V, uh, this is a mistake, there should be J here. And minus a stress tensor sigma, which the stress tensor is a minus pressure times delta I plus this viscous stress tensor. So what is that, what is the form of this additional part of a stress, the sigma prime? Well, it has to describe the viscosity, internal friction. So, uh, it is a stress sensor, which tell us something about the internal friction forces. All right. And you remember that the force in the liquid was proportional to the change of the velocity with the depth. And the change was a, a difference of the velocity over a unit of a change of the depth in the liquid. Therefore, in a general situation, the stress tensor will be something which depends on the derivatives of a velocity. It cannot depend on the velocity itself. And the experiments are telling us that at least for most of the liquids, that dependence of the internal friction force is linearly depending on the, on the derivatives of the velocity. And therefore, the most general form of the stress viscous stress tensor is some coefficients times the derivative of a gradient of the velocity. So that is a linear combination of those derivatives. Well, how do we guess what are the properties of that uh, matrix, which actually is, there is a mistake here, there should be additional indices because, well, anyway, it's a linear combination of this. This, is, this formula is incorrect. There are, missed, there are two indices in the lambda which are missed. That should be correct. And um, let's think what, whether we can guess what kind of a combin linear combination of those derivative of velocity 
can enter the expression for sigma prime. And we can guess that by discussing what happens if we rotate the liquid as a whole. If we rotate the liquid as a whole, then we have solved that problem at home that the velocity is then the rotation frequency vector omega vector product with the radius r or in the indices this is expression but if we rotate the liquid as a whole then the layers of the liquids do not move with each other and if they do not move with respect to each other then there is no internal friction and therefore the stress tensor for the rotation of a liquid as a whole must be equal to zero. Okay, we have a velocity which is a vector product. So the only linear combination of a derivatives of a velocity, which will be identical as zero for the rotation as a, of the liquid as a whole is the di vj plus dj vi, a symmetric combination of this X derivatives of the velocity with respect to indices i and j. You can easily check that this is correct if you take the derivative with respect of that expression for a velocity, once with respect to the j and once with respect to i, and by the asymmetry of that Levi Civita tensor epsilon i j k, that is identically equal to zero. So the since the that is the only combination of a gradients of velocity for which the uniform rotation gives us zero, then we can guess that the stress tensor must be a combination of those symmetric derivatives. And this is the most general expression of that sort. Well, the sigma prime contains the symmetrical part. And this is a, a funny way of writing it. Namely, this is also a symmetric. So these two terms will also vanish for the uniform rotation. So why did I rot it in that strangely looking form? Namely, because this part is a symmetric tensor, which has a vanishing trace. If I calculate the sum of the, of the, the trace of that matrix, that is a sum of terms when i equal to j, then the trace of that is equal to zero. And the trace of that is three times zeta and the, the divergence of v. Well, that part is proportion to the coefficient eta, our old coefficient. But this addition term, which is trace, not for which the trace is not equal to zero, in general might have a different coefficient. And that coefficient relates to the dissipation of energy when the layers of liquids move with, with respect to each other in a radial direction. And this coefficient zeta is another viscosity coefficient. And for that symmetry reason, that it's related to the divergence of a velocity that is a radial flow of a liquid from a given region is called the bulk viscosity coefficient. It turns out that for most of the liquids, we are having around us like the air or the water, that coefficient is extremely small. So that term, might actually, the, the zeta is very small number. But this is a general expression.
And we have two terms in the stress tensor, one which is proportional to the shear, and that's why the trace of it is equal to zero, and the other which is called to the bulk motion of the layers of the liquid with respect to each other. So we have two shear viscosity coefficients in general, and all of both of them are uh, positive numbers. That does not occur from this analysis that eta and zeta have to be positive. And we shall see in a moment why the eta and zeta have to be positive. So we have guessed the form of the stress tensor for viscosity by a simple symmetry argument. That is also something which you should remember studying a continuous media, that you can guess a lot by doing a dimension analysis and also employing a symmetry argument. So now we can write the equations, oh, I'm sorry. Now we can write the equations of motion in the, uh, for viscosity, uh, for viscous liquids in the full glory. Uh, that is a generalization of the, uh, of the, and, uh, that of course is a mistake here. Uh, there is a missing gradient of a pressure and it occur here with the, with the, with the, with the wrong sign. Uh, anyway, this is that on the left side of the conven convective derivative of velocity, uh, there is a derivative of the viscous stress tensor, and there is also a gradient of the pressure. And I had written that expression in terms of the vector notation, and that is a correct expression with the mistake that in here, in terms of a delta, there should be a minus. We, we should remember this, that this, this is a term where the minus had for some reason disappeared. These equations are called the Navier-Stokes equations. And that now it's the Navier-Stokes equation written in a correct form that is with a gradient minus. So please remember that this is, if the viscosity coefficients are equal to zero, then we regain the viscosity, the Euler equation for IDR fluid. And in general, we have two terms. This triangle is a Laplacian operator. We remember what is the Laplacian. It's the sum of a second order derivative with respect to all coordinates. And that is a term which is proportional to the divergence of the velocity. The reason why I had written that in this particular form is that it is a particularly easy to look up at the various properties of that equation by having them written in this form. Okay, so let's start with incompressible fluid. We remember that incompressible fluid is that for which divergence of a velocity is equal to zero because then the continuity equation tell us that the density remains constant. All right, so we uh, have the, we have the incompressibility condition. And then obviously the last term drops out and the Navier-Stokes equation, and there is again a mistake. I must have done something wrong. Namely, there is a minus here. I, I apologize for this minus. This is what happens when you uh, try to simplify your life by doing a cut and paste in typing the formula in tech and occasionally make a mistake. So this is our equation. And let's look what happens when we take a divergence of that equation. Because the velocity is divergence of velocity is equal to zero. So if I take the divergence of it, 
then the divergence of that first term drops out, divergence of that term drops out, and this is also zero. So what is left is that after I do the divergence, my expression is the following, and there should be a minus sign here again. And if I carry that calculation, then this is a I component derivative of a K components of a velocity times the K derivative of the I component of a velocity. So as you see in incompressible viscose fluid, there is a relation between a pressure and velocity. And that relation uh, tell us that I can solve that relation and express a pressure in my Navier-Stokes equation entirely in terms of the velocity field. So the Navier-Stokes equation for an incompressible fluid becomes an equation for a velocity only. The continuity equation is satisfied by incompressibility assumption. So the whole hydrodynamics of viscose incompressible liquid reduces itself to the uh, equation for the velocity. And let me, let me solve that equation. And the solution is that the pressure is given as an integral of this quadratic form in the derivatives of a velocity calculated at the point R prime. This is not very aesthetically written. This dependence of R prime refers to all terms in the numerator of that fraction. And this is an integral. Why it is that integral? Well, because if you apply the Laplacian to the pressure, we have to apply the Laplacian to the one over R. And as you know, the Laplacian of one over R is a delta function. And therefore we got this expression. And uh, because of my mistake in the notation, there should be a different sign here. All right, so that is my expression. And therefore for incompressible fluid, the, this is now correctly written, the pressure is the integral and therefore our equation for a velocity becomes not a differential equation, but the differential equation with integral built in. So this is what is called the differential integral equation for a velocity. And that is the one of the most fundamental equations in the hydrodynamics and also one of the most difficult equation, mathematical equations in the history of mathematical physics. Still, there is a huge award uh, offered by providing a very important proofs of the property of that equation. And in spite of the fact that we are now solving that equation on the supercomputers, then uh, this award is still waiting for maybe one of you uh, to get. Why I had written that right now? This is because the incompressible fluid, viscous fluid dynamics is a base of a, one of the still bothering us a problem in the science. This is called the turbulence theory. We will be talking about the turbulence theory at the end of the viscous fluid physics, but that is a proper point of mentioning it. What is the turbulence? Well, each of you must have looked up behind the moving boat and our experience tell us that the trail left by the moving boat, it never looks like 
what we have discussed in the ideal fluid theory. Namely, we have this strange trail of a little vortices and little shaking waves are behind our boat. That is an example of a turbulent flow. And this is an, another example when the jet goes and what happens when we have a powerful jet of a liquid going in the air and what happens at the end of it. This, how it develops is, has been discussed first time by Newton and the part of that drawing at the beginning here is called the Newton instability. And that is uh, 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 something what people building up the fire brigade water hoses or the water guns for the police are busy with because they don't want to the jet of fluid to become a spread set of droplets before it hits a proper target. So this expression is a fundamental in the theory of a turbulence and the occurrence of that, um, that integral uh, uh, makes the life extremely complicated. All right, so let's uh, now discuss what is important for the differential equation that is a boundary boundary conditions. Uh, we remember that we had the boundary condition for the uh, ideal fluid, which was that if we have a liquid in a contact with the rigid boundary, then the normal component of a velocity of the ideal fluid was vanishing. The situation is very different when we have a viscous fluid, and this is shown here on the our drawing. We have a blue liquid and we have a rigid floor or a boundary. And the boundary condition from experiment tell us that the normal component, that the velocity is equal to zero. The whole velocity vector vanishes on the surface. And that of course imply that the normal component to the surface of the velocity must be equal to zero, but also the tangent components. And on general, there are two vectors which are tangent to the surface, T1 and T2, because there is a two dimensional surface. So the condition that the velocity is equal to zero is not only that the normal component is equal to zero, but also that this tangential component of a velocity are equal to zero. So there has to be the condition that the whole velocity vanish on the surface. So let's look at this when the have with we our boundary is not flat. Well, that we could have used the differential geometry of the curved surfaces to write this expression and it would and it will be a little bit complicated but a very beautiful form of that let but let us do it in a physicist way so i have a liquid in a contact with the rigid curved wall and let's focus our attention to the little element of the surface of the of the boundary this yellowish part and that is a, 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 a vectorial surface element is uh, has a dimension has a normal vector n and let's try to calculate the force which is exerted on that interface on that boundary from the side of the liquid, which is the red force F. Well, the, the force acting on the element of the surface DSJ is just the pressure tensor, the stress tensor, times uh, this element of the surface. 
So if we substitute our definition, we got this expression, all right? Well, but because we have a boundary condition for a viscous fluid that the velocity times a normal component is equal to zero, then the first term does not contribute anything to this expression. And therefore the force acting on this element of the surface of a boundary is just the minus sigma times n. And that if I use the definition of a stress tensor sigma, it's a pressure times a normal direction. And that would be something we know from the ideal fluid dynamics minus a viscous tensor times nj. And that is obviously a force due to the shear of the fluid layers with respect to the, our surface. So let's plug in there the expression for sigma prime. And then we, we, we have it. But let's look what happens in the other situation. Let me just go back to this for a while. Can I have it again? No. Uh, that, that's okay. And let's look at the another situation where we have a situation where we have two non-mixing with each respect to each other liquids, one which is blue and one which is green. And there is an interface in between them, a boundary between them. They are not mixing with each other. So let's look at the geometry, the normal vector pointing into the direction into the liquid, blue liquid is denoted by N1 and the vector, normal vector pointing from the boundary into the green liquid is denoted as N2. So the force acting is F1 and F2. And therefore, by a simple geometry, the normal vector with index one is just the minus normal vector with the index two. We are talking about the flat interface, but this is generally true even if the interface is curved. So if that boundary between the immiscible fluids is in equilibrium, mechanical equilibrium, then the sum of the forces acting on that bl black boundary must be equal to zero. So the sum of those forces must be equal to zero. And each of those forces, as we had just discussed on the previous slide, is equal to the sigma times N1 plus sigma two times N2. So that is a sum of the vectors of those expression is equal to zero. But since the N1 is minus N2, then I can write this expression as a difference between stress tensor in the blue liquid minus stress tensor in the green liquid times the normal vector. So I have a difference of the stress tensor over that boundary. That expression is often called a jump condition. It says, our, says us that the stress tensor might not be the continuous function over that boundary. And the difference of the values of the stress tensor on both sides, which is a jump of it, times the normal vector is equal to zero. The jump of the physical quantity is often written as a square bracket. 
And therefore, this boundary condition on the interface between two in non-mixing liquids is a form that the jump of a stress tensor times a normal component, normal vector is equal to zero. Such a jump conditions on the interfaces between non-miscible liquids is called a, is one of the examples of so-called Cochin condition. And hydrodynamics is full of the Cochin conditions referring to the, what is happening on the interfaces of the liquid. Let me discuss that for a second. Uh, an example of the situation on the drawing is when the green liquid is a liquid and the blue liquid, it's, it's vapor. That is what we encounter on basically any physical boundary between the liquid and the open space. The liquids evaporate and there is always a thin layer of a vapor of that liquid over a surface of the of a liquid by itself. And what is then happening on that such an interface? In addition to the boundary condition we are now discussing, there will be additional contributions coming from the fact that there is a phenomenon which you might remember from a high school, which is called the surface tension. Namely, there is a particular energy which is stored in the fact that if I have the interface between a liquid and its vapor, then a density of a material changes rapidly from a high density phase, which is a liquid, to the low density phase, which is a vapor. So there is a gradient of a density happening on that interface. And there is a jump of a density. And in addition, a liquid evaporates. That is some liquid particles have sufficient amount of energy to get that through the interface into the vapor phase. And there is additional that there are low energy particles in a vapor which condensate on the surface and they contribute now to the, so there is a transport of a mass over a liquid vapor interface. And that all has to be incorporated into the jump conditions given by Mr. Cochin. And that allow us to solve a complicated problems of the interface between liquid and vapor. Where you can see the results, so to say, how the Cochin conditions works in practice is if, if you take a kettle with the water and you boil the water for your tea. Uh, when you put the water into the, your kettle, you'll find out that it's very still. But when the water starts to boil, there is a noise coming out from that kettle. And what is the source of that uh, noise? Is that there are lots of bubble formed in the in the liquid. And when you, when you when you heat the liquid, you create those bubble by a process which is called the nucleation. And there these bubbles grow. And when they grow, they emit a sound. And uh, that sound is what you can hear. And if you want to solve the problem, what is the spectrum of that sound or what happens to such a growing bubble, then you have to use the boundary conditions, the jump conditions, the Cochin conditions. And this was the simple mind that Cochin condition on the interface between the immiscible uh, li uh, two liquids which have. All right, so we have this boundary condition. And if the surface is free, that is, there is uh, 
just the ambient pressure on it, then the there's no stress in the in the blue liquid, and that is therefore the condition on the free surface. So the last topic for today will be the dissipation of energy in a viscous incompressible liquid. Let me again write the expression for the stress tensor, viscous stress tensor, and let me now calculate the kinetic energy of the liquid. The kinetic energy of a liquid is the integral of the density times velocity squared divided by two. And this incompressible liquid, the density is just a constant. So I can use the identity that the time derivative of rho two v squared is just rho times velocity scalar product with the derivative of a velocity. So when I, you want to calculate how the kinetic energy changes in time, I can use the Navier-Stokes equation in a final I manage to write them without making a mistake in a sign. I'm terribly sorry for those mistakes. Then this is the uh, expression for the, the real time derivative of a velocity and therefore I leave the calculations for you to do at home. That is in replacement of any problems. Just it is instructive to do these calculations by yourself. You take derivative of, of the kinetic energy, then it is a in derivative of that integral. That is the formula. And you just have used the, for the time derivative of a velocity that expression. And when you do this calculation, you get the following expression for the integrand of that equation. Time derivative of a kinetic energy density is a minus divergence of that term minus this little contribution. You easily recognize what is under this divergence. This first term, that term, is the pointing vector for the energy conservation of ideal fluid we discussed some time ago. And this is a term of a velocity times a stress tensor for viscosity. That is a term which gives us information about the work per unit time done by the, uh, by the viscous forces. So that's the power which is lost in the liquid due to the viscosity. So now I integrate that and I'm integrating over a volume of a liquid which has a surface at infinity. That is, I cannot draw too big liquid area on my slide because there will be pretty no space for the expressions. So I just indicated that this is infinite volume by sense writing that the surface is at infinity. And I do the integration. So I have a time derivative of this infinite volume integral. This is the diverge integral of a divergence. So I can use Stokes theorem and convert the divergence integral into a surface integral. And uh, th there is a mistake again, I'm sorry. I, it's again copied that integral does not have this, this divergence here. This, this divergence is me. I, converted already the volume integral into the surface integral. So there is no, this nabla here sitting and I have the volume integral for last term. So when I do this calculations, 
then this term drops out. Why it drops out? Well, because it's the integral of an infinite surface of a liquid. And the velocity of the liquid at the infinity is equal to zero. So the whole integral, the surface integral is equal to zero. And when I do this, then what is left is that the time derivative of energy is equal to that term. And this I can easily calculate if I plug the stress tensor for the incompressible viscous fluid. It only contains a shear viscosity coefficient. So that integral by rearrangements of terms is one half of the eta times the symmetric contribution of a derivative square. And therefore, I have a final expression for the time derivative of kinetic energy. And that is a minus eta divided by two times that integral. The change of the kinetic energy due to the dissipation, due to the friction, must be a negative number. This is the integral of a quadratic expression. So the value of that integral is positive because the left-hand side is negative. That implies that the viscosity coefficient must be positive. So this is the argument why the viscosity coefficient, shear viscosity coefficient, which appears in the definition of the Navier-Stokes equation or stress and viscous stress tensor must be positive. A much less simple calculation, but also straightforward leads to the assumption that the zeta is positive. So this calculation not only gives you an expression for a change of a kinetic energy in incompressible viscous fluid, but also serves as a proof that the viscosity coefficient is positive and that similarly a shear a bulk viscosity coefficient is equal to zero. All right. So now we shall discuss a quasi flow. Uh, let's consider a simple, and that we will continue next week, but let me just outline what I'm going to discuss. We have a layer of liquid contained between two boundaries denoted as a black thin lines. And the liquid is homogeneous in direction perpendicular to the screen. The x-axis is along the screen, and the upper direction vertical is called y, and the upper layer, upper boundary, is being pulled with the velocity u. So it's moving. That is a basically a, a picture we started our phenomenological discussion. And we will be discussing what happens and when, how to solve the Navier-Stokes equation for incompressible flow of a liquid in that construction. The velocity field is only in the x direction, but the velocity of a fluid only depends on the y direction. So we have a velocity field which points into the, this direction and it is independent of the Z component, which on my drawing is perpendicular to the screen. We will be solving the Navier-Stokes equation. And the solution is pretty simple because the velocity is on the Y component, then the X and then the, 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 then the X and Z component drop out. And what is left from that equation is that it, the, the Y, that the gradient of a P with respect to Y is equal to zero. And the other is what is left that the Laplacian of the, what is left from the Laplacian is 
that the second derivative of velocity with respect to y axis is equal to zero. So solution of these two differential, ordinary differential equations is trivial. A pressure is constant and the velocity is a linear function of y, of y. So there are two coefficients a and b, all right? So that is an expression. And what are now the boundary condition? On the non-movable surface, the velocity must be equal to zero. So at is equal to zero at y equal to zero. And it sticks to the surface which moves velocity u. So on the upper boundary, the velocity of the liquid must be equal to the velocity with which the upper, upper boundary moves. So the, that gives us the solution for a velocity is y divided by the height the thickness of the, of the layer times u. So I can plug it in the expression for stress tensor and I can calculate the value of a stress tensor on the surface zero. And that turns out to be proportion to eta and velocity divided by h. And sure enough on the upper part is minus. Why it is minus and what it is plus. Well, we, we pull the liquid. So the, li the liquid drags the unmovable lower boundary. And therefore we do the work. We try to pull the lower boundary with the liquid. And we cannot do this because the liquid is boundary is unmovable. So we have a plus. And when we go up, then we move the, inter the boundary with the velocity u. So there is a negative force. The liquid wants to stay. So it applies the fo friction forces against the motion of the upper layer. So the stress tensor must be have a sinus minus. The other thing is what is the average velocity? The average velocity in this situation is simply one half of the, this velocity. So what we have is that the liquid moves with the velocity of the boundary on top. It is still at the bottom. And in a middle, it has the velocity, which is half and half of the upper boundary velocity. So that is a flow of a viscous fluid, which is incompressible in that situation. And next week, we will complicate it, our calculations by assuming that both of the boundaries are not moving, but the liquid is just moving in between them. And uh, I hope you already guess that the solution must be like this, that the velocity on both boundaries is equal to zero. And since it moves into the X direction, then it must be the largest in the middle. So it is not so difficult to guess that the profile of a density in that situation will be a smooth profile, which goes from zero on the upper boundary to zero at the lower boundary and to the something in the middle. So that must be something like a parabola. And actually we will show that this is a parabola on here. And that would allow us to continue with the pipes which have a different geometry to derive the Poisset flow condition. So thank you very much for your attendance and see you tomorrow. Bye-bye, enjoy the rest of the day.